I'm really excited to bring you this conversation with John Jennings and Brian Moss, two of the most talented African-Americans working in graphic design, animation, and comic book creation. This conversation is part of an occasional series that I'll feature on my YouTube channel called White Balance, about people of color bringing much needed representation in media. I hope you enjoy this conversation with John and Brian, and let me know in the comments what you think about the topics that we cover. Yeah, so John, Brian, thanks again for uh, making the time to speak with me and to talk about Black representation and uh, animation and uh, cartooning So uh, and comics. So I appreciate, you make, I appreciate you making the time. Okay. No, thank you, thank for, you having for having us. Chris. Yeah, yeah. So first off, uh, so for people who may not be familiar, can you kind of um, talk about how you got into um, art and animation and kind of what inspired you? Oh, okay. That's pretty easy. It was my mom. <laughs> yeah, I um, my mom was a really or is a really avid, you know, reader and um, and you know she was actually a English uh, major at Alcorn State University, and uh, she met my dad there. You know, got pregnant with me, <laughs> and then uh, ended up moving back to Florida, Mississippi, with my grandparents. And uh, this is like in the night, late nineteen sixties. You know like 1968 or so, 1970. So I grew up like around a lot of books. I mean, I was in it, I was kind of isolated, you know, so, but I started reading uh, really, really early, you know, and, um, you know, she had all kinds of books laying around, including like a lot of books around like psychology and stuff like that. And I was really attracted to like images very, very early on. And I was really into like mythology, you know, like Norse mythology, Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology. So my mom in her infinite wisdom, with, you know, she saw stuff like, you know, Captain America and like Daredevil and Wonder Woman. Because Wonder Woman was like essentially Greek mythology, right? Um, and stuff like, you know, the mighty Thor, for instance. And so she got those for me and I just became really hooked on um, on comics like real fast, you know? <laughs> and I was like into anything that looked like a comic book. So, you know, like those old school, like letter people comics, like Spidey super stories, you know, anything that looked like an illustrated book or of any kind, I was really just attracted to images at a very early age. And then, um, you know, of course, you know, growing up, that's like the golden age of like uh, Saturday morning cartoons, man. I mean, we had stuff like Fred Albert and like the Mighty Orbots and like Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, Herculoids. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> so Hannibal Barra was, the, was just, they were killing it back in the day. <laughs> and then of course we had the afternoon cartoons like He-Man and, you know, when I got into to like, when I was like in, in uh, sort of moving to high school, that was the first time I saw like, I guess, you know, what I guess it was anime, right? Robotech and, uh, and Voltron and stuff like that, you know, Battle of the Planets, you know, these types of things. So I was like, you know, watching all this, the GI Joe, Silverhawks, you, you name it. I was into all that stuff. And uh, yeah, but even I was a big fan of Flintstones too. Hilarious, like <laughs> it was hilarious. So yeah, so that's, that's kind of like how I got started with it. I mean, and it just became a passion. I mean, I don't like do a lot of animation. I've done like designs for animated things, but uh, you know, the comic side of things, I just became totally obsessed with. <laughs> yes, and it, and it was, as soon as as soon as my mom got me that stuff, man, I was like, "Yep, this is this is the thing for me." <laughs> so. Wow, wow. <clears throat> Brian, how about you? Um, yeah, for me, I'm ten years younger than John, so I was born in '81, and well, that what's that, John? Like ten, eleven. Well, I, feel, I, like, I love how you rub this county. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I got I'm much I got younger than this old, this old part here. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, it's funny though because my earliest memories are like what you're talking about, John. Like mm -hmm. the cartoons, you know, um, mainly uh, Masters of the Universe. Yep. But it's pretty funny though. So, like, just to back up a little bit, I discovered I was into art around five, six. And then my mom threw me right into like, you know, the programming for that. So like rec center type of art. So it's going to sound, this might sound unbelievable to a lot of people, but I didn't see a comic or know about comics until I was like 10 or 11 years old. Mm. It was because um, the environment I grew up in didn't have that stuff. 
Um, so it just was abstracted to me. The idea of Spider-Man was from like a hot air balloon, you know, on the Thanksgiving Day Parade. So a lot of people discover comics when they're like two, three, but for me, it was like around 10, which is an interesting component because up until that point for that previous three to four years, it was just all art. So I had a very traditional art upbringing, but then once I discovered a comic, I got hooked, right? Because that's like a feeding frenzy for like my imagination. So throughout my teenage years, that's when everything opened up. So you're talking like um, a lot of the independent animators came through at that point. Um, you're like uh, on Nickelodeon. So that would be like Ren and Stimpy, Rugrats, all that stuff. Um, Liquid Television, um, what else was during that time? Beavis and Butthead. So a lot of that really independent animation was my first introduction to like something outside the norm. And then after that, it was like anime. So like Akira, because the shell came out in the theaters around 96. I remember that was like a big deal. And like, that's where everything kind of came to this like grand, like apex, right? And so I was like, I had, I felt like I had every aspect of nerd culture uh, in my arsenal at that point. So yeah, I would say probably by the time I was like 14. So that's like 94. That's when I discovered that package. So yeah, so ever since I've been doing it, you know, it's interesting. That makes sense to me because <clears throat> if you are starting the time frame, it makes a lot of sense because, you know, what happens is, of course, the, the comics move from being ubiquitous in like newsstands and, um, you know, stop and goes and gas stations and stuff like that. And it becomes, and they move into um, uh, these specialty shops, right? The direct market. Mm -hmm. Direct yeah. market starts in like about 78 79 or so and then of course everybody dials into it in, in in the 80s you know yeah and i remember that distinctly when the comics went away right mm -hmm. yeah because they yeah. used to, to be you could get you could get, get like uh secondhand comics uh you know the ones that they would rip the covers off of and they put those they, and they bundle them up because they would resell them you know um yeah that they did they stopped doing that too and so that's really interesting mm -hmm. so basically what happened is that when they did that because of your access point you didn't get a chance to see them into the 90s, which totally makes sense. And you know, yeah, it's unfortunate. But yeah, interesting. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's it, oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. No, I was just gonna say, what what do you think was the uh, uh, the reason behind that? Why comics went into specialty shops rather than um, you know, just being in newsstands and wherever you else, you would buy other publications? Well, I mean, what happens is it, it's, it's a lot more consistent because before, you know, you could actually be if you if you like trying to find like Superman number 53, right, you know, and you're going to your newsstand or you're going to your stop and go or whatever to find it, then um, you might not be able to find it until uh, a couple of months later, or, you know, you'll find the next, the, like the, the next to last issue and it'll just be all over the place. They, they, they didn't really have a, um, there really wasn't a, a consistent distribution net, net, network for comics, you know, because they, was, they were considered to be like such low mediums. And so the gentleman, I forgot his name, that created the direct market. I think he was visiting DC Comics, you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Brian, but it was like, you know, late seventies or so, he goes to the DC Comics, uh, you know, um, offices and he sees all these comic book covers, were, you know, ripped off the, off the covers, they, they were off the comics, they would rip them off because it, was, it would make them uh, lighter to ship back because if, because what happened was originally like the, the comics market was very similar to the regular pub publishing market, you know, like when you don't sell books, you know, retailers can send you, send your unsold books back, you know, but what's interesting about the direct market is that, you know, when a, when a retailer buys comics, they keep them, you can't send them back. You know, so it actually it's a very it's a much more attractive, you know, deal for for the comics publishers. So so it was that too. But what happens is though is that um, because of this, you know, both Brian and myself came up, you know, financially challenged. And <laughs> so it's like, you know, I grew up in the sticks, but you know, but I grew up pretty poor, you know, and and, and Brian was in a, in a in a financial situation too, right, in, in Columbus, right. And so, mm -hmm. you know, those particular stores weren't popping up, and you know. The sticks of the hood, so to speak, you know. So that, and that's what it was about access. So I think uh, exactly it was a business decision, though. It was a business decision. They consolidated it, and um, you know, the big two, you know, Marvel and DC, they 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 signed on to it. You know, it just mm -hmm. made yeah. Because yeah. I remember my first um, 
foray into a comic book shop, I was, you know, when you're young, I was about, like I said, 10 or 11. Yeah. And I remember that was like the first time I walked out of my neighborhood. We all know that feeling, you yeah. know? And there was this place called, it was a laundromat, then a place called Collector's Corner. And I was just like, what is a Collector's Corner? And I go in and they have, well, it was just kind of like a multi, kind of like a head shop, but not a head shop, you know, everything but that part. So yeah. it had like porn, um, novelty things, and then comics at all, its own comic area. Right. And I was like, but it, and it's funny that I went after the comics, right? And so <laughs> I <laughs> have like all this stuff. And I mean, it's even a different time, right? Because they wouldn't let a kid in that store today. No, but, no, um, yeah, that's so, <laughs> right. so yeah, it was like, I remember the comic too. It was like Marvel Comic Presents. And it had Sam Keith cover of Wolverine. It was like in 1991, you know? So it was oh. like, oh, what's this thing? So I was hooked immediately. I put stuff into perspective, man, because I'm like, you know, the first comics I was picking up, you know, and not, not to not to like make it super comics heavy, but- um, No, you're fine. When, I, when I'm going to like the, the, the stop and goes and stuff, you know, in the, in the mid seventies is when, they had this thing called the Commerce Code Authority, right? Where in the mm -hmm. 1950s, um, you know, comics were booming. They, they actually had like these, uh, you know, in, 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 like in the middle of what they call the golden age. A lot of these comics after the Second World War were like horror comics and crime comics, and they were violent and messed up, but they were also morality tales, actually. And Brian knows this very well, being that the mm -hmm. evil path you know, is kind right. of dealing with that, his book. Uh, so, um, yeah, but 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 these Senate subcommittee hearings, it, you know, America's always been a very conservative country. It pretends that it's not, but it, it really is. And uh, you know, so they actually like made comics uh, censor themselves, right? And so, but in the 1970s, I want to say like 77 or so, they changed those laws on comics, so they were actually able to do things that were a little bit more um, cutting edge and stuff, right? But then at the same time, that uh, the Comics Code Authority only dealt with comic books. And not with periodicals, right? Mm. So, so you would get these crazy lurid black and white magazines like Vampirella, The Rook, you know, the Warren magazines like Creepy and Eerie, right? Which I was just totally addicted to. It's like these totally terrifying stories, not for kids at all. But you know, they they could they weren't they were uncensored, you know, horror stories, right? And I was just really really into that. And then of course. Uh, not to be our done, right? Marvel, I want to say in the 1980s or so, late, eight, they started stuff like Epic Illustrated because they're trying to compete with stuff like heavy metal, you know, magazines like that. So like uh, very beautifully produced uh, adult fantasy magazines, you know? And so I was reading all that stuff because my mom saw it. She didn't think it was, I mean, it's, it was, to her it was a comic book. Like, so <laughs> she, I just showed her cover. like, oh, it's pretty, right? Yeah, you can buy it, cool. <laughs> Put down a dollar fifty or whatever it was, and I went home <laughs> looking at like half naked elves and <laughs> all kinds of all kinds of wild wizards and beheadings. And <laughs> I love it. Out of control up in there. <laughs> so, anyway, but yeah, so that's that's the thing though. You know, because it was an illustrated book, you know, she didn't she didn't distinguish between the medium, you know, which I thought was really cool. So. So what was uh, each of your paths to becoming a professional artist and going into uh, comics yourselves? I mean, creating comics yourselves. Uh, do you, I'll go ahead and go, John, I guess. Um, for me, it was kind of uh, my way out. So it was kind of like, almost like a by any means necessary because one of, I remember the art class vividly. It was, I was around eight and we had this thing on Fridays at Schiller Park in Columbus, Ohio, German Village. And it was this thing called Artisipation. And what happened was that it took place on Friday. And then after the class, they were like, oh, hey, these like two guys in my class are brothers. They were like, oh, you want to come over and eat? I was like, sure. We walk across the street into like a mansion. And I was like blown away. You know, I'm like, wait this the people in my art class are like rich and they have mansions and they could eat it was almost like the art world opened up to me because I realized by the art gave me access to a way out of my situation mm -hmm. so it was kind of just like um 
a do or die kind of situation almost. I was like fully convinced by the age of seven, eight that I was going to go into art. Um, and what that led to with me being really aggressive in the 90s, um, when I was like 14, 15, this would be 95, I started going to comic book conventions, trying to get jobs, which is kind of funny. I'm hopping on Greyhound as like a 14 year old turning 15, going to Wizard, I think it was like Wizard World at the time. Wow. And all of my idols are there. And I'm like doing a trip, a 24 hour turnaround. So I'm leaving at like 4.35 in the morning getting there by the time the convention opens um out at the at the time it's out by the o'hare airport and then i would go submit my portfolio get contacts all that stuff and then head back to columbus and just sleep on the greyhound on the way back at like you know it would be like 9 p.m 10 and then i get back you know four three go home <laughs> I was like, I was Chicago. I was like, nice, well, I made nice. some contacts. <laughs> so um, that kind of gave me the confidence and it taught me a lot. Um, and then when the internet came out, I had access to that. That's when it really changed because I knew all I had to do was sit and wait and develop my skill and the internet would take care of the rest. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> God bless the internet. No, it's funny. Right. Like, uh, you know, I... I want to say, because I started drawing at an early age, and like I said, I was first. The first thing you try to do is you try to copy things that you're into, right? So I was, I think, like when I was in the first grade, I was really into Popeye the Sailor Man. You know what I'm saying? I just, mm -hmm. I just love that cartoon, you know. And uh, I think a lot, like a lot of kids, it made me like, you know, fall in love with spinach at an early age. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like my mom, I'm like, mom, yeah. you spinach. She's like, you want to eat spinach? I'm like, yes, I definitely want to eat spinach. Have you not seen this no, cartoon? I, Let me I tell swear, you, about. John, I thought I was the only one who had that thought. No, I dude, got that. I mean, come on, like <laughs> the spinach sales across the world had to skyrocket. <laughs> anyway, yeah, same with me too. See, see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like Chris was eating all the spinach, right? <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so um, so uh, 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 you know, I I tried to draw like my my own like. Uh, Popeye the Sailor Man comic book like when I was in the first grade you know um, and then I think the next time I remember trying to make comics was um, it had to be like maybe the fourth or fifth grade or so and that's when you start making knockoffs of your favorite characters right like I had a um, I, I combined like Tony Stark and the Master Kung Fu and um, and, and the Black Panther into a character was called the Panther, right? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I had a character. I was a we got to bring daddy. it back, John. And I was a big daddy. I know. Actually, there's a couple of characters I created. I was like, you know what? Uh, as I got older, I got better at creating characters. But, um, you know, when, uh, then the other one, because I'm a big Daredevil fan, so I had this character called Devlin. <laughs> <you know? laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was doing stuff like that. And then... Um, you know, I, I think I think around age twelve or so, I I, I really started to, to look at like the comics and, and realize that wait a minute, this actually might be a job. I kind of understood what a job was to a certain degree, right? And you know, my mom went to work, and there was money happening somewhere, and it was consistent. And then when I looked at these comic books, I realized that there were there were people's names connected to these particular jobs, like his artists, you know, Bob Layton, you know. Inker, Terry Austin, that kind of stuff, right? And I was like, oh, wait a minute, these are jobs. <laughs> these are actually like someone's doing this for a living. So I remember like, I remember the day I told my grandma, I said, grandma, you know, I'm going to actually call my, my grandma Momo. I said, Momo, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm actually going, I just discovered what I want to do. I want to be a comic book artist and I'm going to move to New York because I realized like all these things come in New York because if you look at the indicia on the front page, it says mm -hmm. where it's published, right? You know, that's, the, that's what I, you know, the address to Marvel Comics is on every comic and just in, this, in the bottom part of the, of, the, of the first page. And I was like, I'm gonna move to New York and I'm gonna draw comics. And I remember my grandmother like burst into tears, you know, <laughs> cause she was so sad. She was like, no, you can't leave me. It was like, and I remember that was the first time I like really, really actively lied to my grandmother. <laughs> cause I was like, 
because I was like, I'm so sorry. I no, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not. I, I just made that up. But I'm sorry. I was just teasing. <laughs> but no, I was but trying to. I was trying to make. It's funny though, if you think about John, because you're like a really smart. They could probably see that really early on. You're super precocious, and the last thing they would want you to do is become an artist, right? Yeah, like, right. No, no thing. rocket scientist. No, but she was. She just wanted. My grandma didn't want me to go anywhere. My grandma wanted to be there with her. I was her favorite yeah. child, and she just wanted me uh, there. Right. Oh, that was yeah. The rest of that stuff is like yeah. Anyway, so um, I I went to the military first. So I, I I always was good at art, but my mom, you know, was and she encouraged me, but she looked at it as a hobby, right? And like you said, uh, Brian, I was pretty good at school, you know, but no one ever really told me like, yo, you you could go to college and become an artist. No one was saying that around me, <laughs> and like. <laughs> You know, no one was saying like, hey, you know, maybe you could be a graphic designer or, you know, trying to figure out what what kind of skills are connected to art, you know, that kind of thing. Nope. My mom was like, you should be a doctor, a lawyer, or you could go to the military and retire, you know, because she, but you can't be an artist. You're going to cut your ear off and die in a box. You know, <laughs> it was kind of <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I was like, she, she actually like conflated like Basquiat and, and like Van Gogh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I love it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so I went to the military and uh, I was in an accident and when I was when I was uh, on on maneuvers at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and I broke my foot really badly and I had to have reconstructive surgery on it. And I, they were like, yo, we can't train you anymore, dude, get out. <laughs> and I was like, OK. And then I was, and but then because Jackson State, you know, a lot of HBCUs, their their entry points, like their uh, admission uh, guidelines, a lot of times they're, they're deep into the summer, you know. Like you can actually still apply to school in August, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So I was like laid up, you know, um, you know, with my foot all jacked up in, in a in a medical hospital, in a military hospital. And uh I reached out to Jackson State University and I actually was able to get a scholarship, you know, because I was valedictorian of my my class. And uh, um at, at the time, like East Florida High School, it was mandatory to take the ACT and I did really well on it, you know, but I still went to the military. You know, no one was still like, hey dude. Maybe you should think about going to college. <laughs> you know, it just, anyway, uh, no, no, no detracting from the from the military at all. It's just that it wasn't it wasn't the uh, the space for me. And then I went to Jackson State University and I majored in um, commercial art with a minor in drawing. And uh, I was in honors college there at the W. D. Du Bois Honors College. You know, full ride. You know, it was crazy. Is my you know how much my scholarship was for four years at Jackson State? You about, you about they about to really know how old you are, John. Oh, it's crazy. How much y'all think? Um, okay. What year would this have been? You know what? You're really close, actually. You're the closest, uh, Chris. Uh, 16, $16,000. Wow. wow. Four, year, four year ride, room and board. Oh, 16 grand. I know. Right? Anyway, so uh, when I was there, I actually I actually started making, you know, I was I was started making like uh, flyers for, um, for, uh, uh, you know, frats and sororities, you know, stuff like that for parties and things like that. So I actually became like a little entrepreneur when I was on campus. And then I actually did, I worked for the school newspaper, the Blue and White Flash. I was the comics guy, I did like illustrations and stuff. And then I got like, um, I managed to get an internship at the local news, like the, the big time newspaper in Jackson, Mississippi. And then, you know, they offered me a job, but I still was like really into, art I wanted to, and I was really curious you know I had a very curious mind so I ended up going to grad school and that's kind of like how I ended up going into education because I um I really liked I really liked knowledge and I was like really into like well maybe I could teach art you know and so I got a, my first master's in art education and then I finished um in 97 with my MFA in studio art you know with a focus on design so that was kind of like the the path that led me to where I am now and then from then on you know I just kept pushing. So after I got my MFA, I uh, ended up coming back to Jackson, Mississippi, and I started their graphic design program at Jackson State. So, and I was there for four years and, you know, blah, 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 the rest is history. Anyway, let me know if you want to know more. I'm going to stop talking, but that's, you know, it's been a really, I, basically I've been a professor since I was like 27 and, I, and I've been, um, you know, I'm 51 now. And, you know, so I've been in, I've been teaching for a long time. This is my fourth post as a Professor, I don't teach art anymore. I actually teach media studies now. But um, you know, for twenty years, I was a design professor. You know, so it kind of sounds like you kind of just had to find your own path. And it's interesting that you chose the military because it's like 
it's like you were determined to get out, get out one way or another. I mean, I had you, to get you, out you lied Florida. to your grandmother so <laughs> that you weren't going anywhere, but then you choose the military. I had to go to Florida. I mean, I had to get out of Florida, man. But yeah, it was, um, I mean, it seemed, everybody was leaving, you know, all my friends were going, and actually other thing too, like a lot of my friends went to the military, you know, like I had a, all my best friends were going, were, were going to the service, most of them, you know, and then my, another one of my best friends, um, he just started working right out of school. So this, this is still actually a time when you can actually get out of school and get a good job with just a high school diploma, you know what I'm saying, actually believe it or not. And so, you know, so he worked, worked at this battery company. And then later on, he ended up starting his own painting company, you know what I'm saying, like, so painting, doing like really big contract work, just painting, you know, buildings and stuff. So, you know, but most of the people in, you know, in my hometown, you know, they, there's a lot of people that went to the military, you know, and, um, and I think it was a boom around that area too. This is, and I, I just missed that desert storm, by the way. Mm. Yeah, I just missed it. Yeah, so I, my accident was, you know, like I said, in like 89 or so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Once you got into college, was there an advisor who kind of steered you on uh, which major you should take, or was it just kind of like your own research and deciding you know, uh, what your interests were? That's a really good question. So when I went to Jackson State in undergrad, I was part of, uh, like I said, the, uh, the Honors College, and Dr. Maria Luisa Alvarez Harvey was the dean, and she personally met with all of her students. The dean of the Honors College met with you and went over your schedule with you. God, she's one of the most amazing women I ever met. You know, she just passed away not too long ago, but she was like another mother to me and was extremely hands-on with making sure that all of her students, you know, um, took the right classes and did the right things. And was, we're talking about a woman who came from Mexico, taught herself how to, how to speak English and excelled on every level and brought her family over, you know, um, from Mexico, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's incredible amazing woman you know so yeah so we were very fortunate um that that was happening and yeah and then also we had people like dr anderson macklin who at the time was my department chair you know he actually was very instrumental in me and my friend chalmers going to graduate school you know so and that's that's how we ended up at grad school we didn't even know what grad school was <laughs> we were like wait there's more school <laughs> <laughs> we're like hold up wait wait what do you mean post what what but we just did four years. What are you talking about? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Hilarious. Anyway, we. I, but the thing is, though, is that when I went to, um, at the time, Jackson State was still severely underfunded. This is actually before the Ayers case. You know, the, the, the Ayers case, Mississippi basically determined that um, the, all the HBCUs in Mississippi were being uh, uh, egregiously underfunded uh, according to racialized lines, you know? And um, yeah, and so after that, of course, there was a windfall of like money and stuff. Before that, you know, we were just like, we didn't have any money. And it was like about 10,000 students on the campus total. When we went to, we did a tour of, of, of University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and our little country minds were like blown open. There was like, <laughs> we had just never seen that kind of money. I was like, oh my God, this campus is, this is, I'm tired walking around this campus. What the hell is going on? <laughs> you know, it was crazy. Like, so um, I remember going into their student union. No, was it a union? No, their bookstore. I remember going to the campus bookstore at U of I, and their bookstore was bigger than our entire campus union. <laughs> wow. I was like, where am I? And it, but, I, but I knew I wanted it, though. That's the other thing, too. Like, once I knew it was there, I wanted it. So. Yeah. How about you, Brian? What was your path um, to? Yeah, so actually it's great that you asked that question because it's a little bit of an outlier, you know. So originally when I graduated, I was pretty much couch surfing and then I moved in with my sister, uh, high school that is. Um, born in, like, I just went to the school, public school in Columbus, you know, so born and raised on the South End, you know, South High School graduate, 99. Now, the following year, I was like, okay, I'm going to get everything, like get my way to get everything together. You know, so then the following year, I was like, I'll apply for school. So in 2000, I applied for TCAD. And this isn't a knock towards the school, but I got there and I realized that it was mainly because I saw, because of my peer group, um, I felt like I was around a lot of kids, which 
because I was pretty serious. You know what I mean? I thought art was a serious thing. And then I get to college and it's like, they're like, it's like just goofing off and stuff. And Mm -hmm. I never really, that never really took to me well. So I immediately like unenrolled. And then I went across the street and I had to work at the art museum uh, because my father worked there prior. So I was very familiar, familiar with the art museum. And I would say that was like my tenure. I did about 20 years, started out in security, you know, it's a low level job. And when I left, I end up working in the curatorial department, the learning department. So that means I'm like um, archiving Amina Robinson stuff. And then I'm also um, doing educational programming, which that pivoted me into teaching at universities. So um, that would include lectures and stuff like that. And then I taught at CCAD for a few years and that was for their um, adult programming. And then ever since then, like something I'm doing right now currently is I'm actually doing the art programming, developing the programming for the summer schools for the um, Columbus City Schools. So it's kind of like I brute forced my way into that system um, to where they're paying me versus me paying them going to school. So just because of the work through my CV and also connections, I have to give a lot of like props to John in that case. So. John put me in Harvard a couple of times, I think, a few Harvard <laughs> shows. So stuff like that, actually, like they were, I'm here and they're like, oh, you have a art at Harvard. Hey, do you got time to teach? You know, like they pay attention to you real quick. So it was just through hard work, really. But um, it was more about the discipline, right? And that's the shared experience with um, on that collegiate level is that I worked during that time where I left CCAD and spent my time at the art museum um, that I couldn't ask for a better like school of learning because you're learning art history, um, contemporary. I handled art that people would never believe that I touched, you know what I mean? In the sense of like, you know, curating and everything. And so it's one of those things that you can't get in art school. And so with my discipline, multidiscipline, so I would be painting and uh, comics. And when I say comics, that also includes animation Mm -hmm. and everything underneath that umbrella. So that really kind of like throughout throughout the course of time really helped me to become who I am today in the sense of um, my path I have now, you know, the success I have for whatever that's worth. Yeah, so we all grew up, you know, where, um, you know, there were maybe Black characters here and there, but I mean, it wasn't a lot of, you know, there wasn't something, Black Panther didn't, you know, the movie version didn't come out until 2018. So there was, you know, and there was Blade back in the 90s, the, the yeah. movie version. But I mean, there wasn't something that was like a huge representation of African Americans in, in comics. Did you ever come to like a realization like, hey, there's like a, a dearth of representation of people who look like me or was it sort of not even a conscious thought of when you started going into um, creating comics? That's a good that's a good question. You know, it's funny because I grew up in Mississippi where like, you know, <laughs> racism is like stewed to perfection. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> so much, it's like, oh, mm, this is delicious racism. It's like perfect, perfectly seasoned. Yeah, it's part of like everything, you know. So I grew up like in the shadow of Emmett Till, you know what I'm saying? My mom, you know, I remember I remember the first time I saw those photos in Jet Magazine, like they still were reprinting them and stuff. So, you know, the notion of race and constructions of race started to seep in at the edges, I think, at a young age. But um, I really didn't get super po- politicized about representation until I went to graduate school. Because up until that Ooh. point, up until that point, we were ubiquitous. You know what I'm saying? I went to, a, I went to a HBCU, so it was like Jackson State, it's like 99.99.99% black. <laughs> Everybody black. <laughs> it was, it was, it was crazy. And I went to a, you know, even though, you know, this was post civil rights era, you know, school system, we were still segregated. Like all the white people in my little town, like they all were let, they all the children of the people that owned the land, which are the white people, right, in the country. And, you know, and so they they went to tri- this place called Tri-County Academy, right? So, you know, I didn't really see or hang out with, with white kids until. Uh, there was, um, and this, and I hate to say it, but this this kid is probably a serial killer now <laughs> because he was 
because Alan Shoemaker was his name. And sorry, but he came in and he was he was too he was he was working class. He was probably, you know poor white kid and was tiny and was like brutally teased by everybody, which took a lot of heat off of me because to that point, you know, I was actually brutally teased by everybody. <laughs> so I was the the poor like country bumpkin smart kid nerd art guy right anyway so um yeah I, I really i don't think i didn't think i thought about like you know constructions of identity until i went to um until i went to grad school and that's why i realized like wait a minute now i understand why we're calling minority <laughs> wait <laughs> hold up and so when i started seeing it they weren't teaching black history like black art history like you know when i was at uh when I was going to grad school, I was like, noticed like there was no trace of anything that actually spoke to the fact that black there were black artists. Like there was no no teaching of the Harlem Renaissance, and this is stuff that I had I had to learn. Like when I went to 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 Jackson State, you know, I had to I had to take like a couple of classes on African American art history. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I I really don't think until like the '90s when like milestone media is jumping off, and then of course you have this. Uh, this outpouring of um, black independent comics like like Brother Man and like Turtle on Lead, you know, coins the phrase the black the black age of comics, and he starts this, he starts the first like black convention, and then of course you have stuff like Ania, which is like six different publishers fused together into one publishing entity, right? Yeah, uh, and then of course you have stuff like um, the LA Phoenix on the, on the West Coast uh, that uh, David O'Brown is doing, right? And then um, you know, you you have like these black independent comics, uh, and, and there was and, and there was like a there was a cultural awareness of like black independent uh, art and stuff. So you of course you have like the uh, the black independent like film movement in you know particularly L.A. area. I forget, I think it's called I forgot the name of it though at the moment. <laughs> but yeah, but it was a black indie film movement, and then also of course you had like there was black sitcoms and stuff like that and of course you had like gangster exploitation you know <laughs> so it was like black everywhere so it was a very different time um and uh yeah and i got politicized around it you know and i wanted to work i actually wanted to work for milestone and i remember i finally like uh got a chance to like i, I put together like a little portfolio uh, i want to say it was like 94 something like that 95 I forgot when they stopped publishing, but it was around the same time. And everybody was like, oh, well, they don't, they're not publishing anymore. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I actually still have those pages, actually. I, I want to I want to go back and ink them in color. John, you got to post them, dude. That'd be awesome. I posted, I think I might have posted like the drawings, but it's like they're so, I think they're terrible personally, but you know. I might, I might, I might ink them in color them just to see what happens. That'd be sweet. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll work. Maybe I'll end up working for Milestone. You know, <laughs> you could bring back Milestone. How about that? But they're already back. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, they're already back. They just, uh, they just, they beat me too. Yeah. Them. They're they're like great. Shop recently. Yeah, they're great actually, and they just announced that uh, Blood Syndicate's coming back, and this new comic book called Duo is coming back too. So you know. Oh, cool. Yeah, they're back. <laughs> anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, for me, um, it's interesting because growing up in that environment, and like when I discovered comics, that kind of opened everything. But the a lot one thing a lot of people know about me is I'm actually biracial. So my mom's white, my dad's black. And so for me, it was always this world of duality. So it's like I would it was it's almost speaking a foreign language, honestly. So I could see like I would be like with my uh with, you know my black friends, you know, it'd be like, you know, we see I would see notice something and they wouldn't even pick up on it that like, you know, that guy is racist. You know what I mean? Because like I've seen it before on when I would be with my white friends, you know, on the other side. So it's just like almost a foreign language that I picked up. And what happened was that um, everything John described was like things that I discovered in my childhood, meaning like Spawn and all these kind of characters, these reinventions, um, <clears throat> Brother Man. Like I remember that would be at the shop too. Like you would get, all that stuff was there. Uh, same way for film, you know? So you're thinking like, um, John Singleton, all that stuff, you know, Spike yeah. Lee. So I was just fully immersed in that. Um, so it, between like 89 and like 97, I would say, it was like magical to me. Like all I knew was like all this black cool stuff. And then so what happened though, is like going back to that thing where I traveled to Chicago to try to get jobs and stuff. I was offered jobs 
from people in Chicago because it's like I'm coming off the Greyhound. It's like predominantly black area. But then I would go to these comic conventions and the editors were all white. And so they would like give me feedback. It was actually like would be considered positive feedback. But I took it personal because I'm like, yo, you don't know my experience. You know, like, what do you know? You don't have more experience than me. <laughs> later on they know clearly they do more right but it was one of those things where it's like kind of like a punk rock attitude you know it's like no i'm gonna do it so it's a very brute force approach so the characters the characterization of black superheroes for me was always there it was never like a peripheral thing or a thing that i grew that came after me and then you have to remember boondocks right that was huge for me because that's me turning like 18, 19. I was looking at those books at the library. And then all of a sudden there's this anime version that I couldn't even like wrap my head around. So for me, it was always a supportive black process. It's, I never veered from that, honestly. So hmm. developing the style though is what counts. So like when I would develop my like skill set, <clears throat> it's weird because it comes across like this European painting style. But then like, I can like flip it and do like things, tap into like my childhood and extract things, um, visual language that's like, you know, more susceptible to like, you know, my black side. So it's almost as if that language I'm speaking from both sides can like cross pollinate now. So it's always been there. And I've always held on to it because of, I knew how valuable it was, you know? So it's something I never let go of. Yeah. So did you did you all start working together through um, through SoulCon, the uh, brown and black or black and brown uh, comic expo? Or you had known each other before that or outside of that? Or mm -hmm. John, I can speak to exactly when we first met because I probably remember better than you do because you know a lot of people. Yeah. yeah, so you guys came to Columbus. You came to CCD. It was you and Stacy. This would have been the earlier mid two thousands, and you guys were on a panel with Victor Dandridge. Yeah, and. Um, if you remember that, I remember after the event, because I know Victor, and then I remember Stacy asking me like, what kind of camera you got? It was like a Nikon. He was like, use the other camera. And so then it was like, oh yeah, then we connected. So that would have been, I think around 2010 at the latest. Mm -hmm. So that's how long I've known John, but John can speak to the rest of our relationship. Yeah, I, I'm like, um, yeah, I think the first time we actually like, so, so was that it up. What we met on online? We yeah well time? well the event was in person you guys were here in person so this yeah, is no, this what I'm saying, but, but, but I just, we chopped it up online okay yeah. and okay. then when cxc soulcon came around that was our you're already family by that point so yeah, we, were already, we were already kind of like uh talking online and stuff and like emailing each other about projects. yeah yeah mm -hmm. we were, yeah because what happened was i remember um brian had posted some artwork and i was like and i just hit him on you know i just uh uh, hit him in his direct messages. I was like, yo, I really love your work. And, you know, and I think that's probably when we exchanged emails and things. And then he sent me this monster. Yeah. And this brain, monster. brain was part of that connection too. Brain was part of the connection too. Yeah, David Brain. Yeah. So, yeah. um, because I knew that I was, because because I don't think we were actually, you know, Facebook friends at the time, but because of the fact that you were friends with other people like Victor and David, you know, you, yeah, would, be, fondly. I, you would be in my thread, you know what I'm saying? So that's, that's kind of, I remember yeah. that. So, and so what happens is like, he sent me like, we collaborated on a monster image actually and uh he sent me this monster that i colored and he was like excited about what i did with the colors and so he's like yo so we just started talking about ways to to collaborate you know and um yeah that's how we became friends and you know did, since then we actually um have worked on some comics together we've been we've, you know he's been in like a lot of yeah. shows we've done you know um it's been really kind of like a uh We've been collaborating for a long time, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, it's yeah. funny when we look back at it, actually. Yeah, you don't really think about it. It's so natural. You're like, oh, wait a minute. It's been like a, almost, it's been like a decade. It's been like a decade. <laughs> right. Know? It's yeah. like, almost. it's probably over. But it's yeah, over it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of cool because like, obviously like John is like big bro, but it's also like a mentorship. And it's one of those things where you really need that aspect. And it's like, but almost it's coming in with like respect, right? So it's like, I'm not going to rely on John because that's not fair to him. But at the same time, it's like he put me on game and put me on projects. So it's one of those things where no different than my other mentors. It's like they changed my life. So I don't have to like work as hard. You know what I mean? In the sense I can actually express my creativity 
versus like having to like struggle work you know what i mean you know that, that that's the thing it's like you i think you're supposed to once you get to a spot and you and you see that people are are, are really wanting to work hard and get into the space then i think it's i feel it's your duty to, to do that you know what i'm saying and so you know that's that's one of the things like this guy is really talented and he's hungry and there's opportunities you know so um you know you try to like make as much space as possible that's I think that's what I've kind of dedicated a lot of my career to actually, you know, just trying to be, I wanted, I just wanted to be the being in, 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 in other people's lives that I didn't necessarily have, you know what I'm saying? You know, or, or I struggled to find, you know. I think it's great that you, that you mentor people like that, John, because a lot of people are like, you know, well, I got mine, now you get yours and, or see people as, you know, competition rather than somebody that you can collab with. Potential collaborators. Yeah, exactly. You know, like to me, it's like, oh, you dope. We need to work together. <laughs> right, right. You know? it's, instead of being mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, you got to take what's mine. I was like, that's for, yeah, you know. And yeah, I, it's funny. It's funny because that scarcity mindset, like in Columbus, um, Chris, you might be able even to attest to this. It's like in the 90s and the early 2000s, it was heavy with this like compartmentalizing or separation. Like this is mine, you know, don't step in my turf. And I was always like hurt by that because I was always like a, a step back because, you know, I'm into like anime and all this other weird stuff. And so like in the art world, they're just like painting gurus and masters. So it was like, so it was a lot of gatekeeping. So then I was like, man, when I get older, I'm not going to do that to anyone. So like right. by the time I connected with John, I ended up changing the game in Columbus with the art because I started putting on younger artists. Yeah. And so it was just one of those things where, you know, it's a, um trickle up and it trickle down at this point so it's beautiful no I, I agree i agree so when you all collaborate is it just kind of an organic process where you where john you have an idea and you think oh this would be great to work with brian on this or vice yep. versa or, it, it is kind of like that actually <laughs> it's like a, yeah it's the, the easiest it's the easiest partnership ever honestly right i just you know then i know that whatever i could uh think of about that, that Brian's gonna flip it. He's gonna add his his narrative style to it, and it's about trust. You know what I'm saying? Collaboration. You gotta trust the people that you work with, understand and respect them, and be like, you know, I realize like there's no I in team. I know that's really cliche, but that's not how you spell team. You know? there, there is me. There is me though. There is in me, but yeah, that, that is the point. point. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, it's one of those things where like um, it was always funny because. I always like things that are natural, like the progress of things, because it's like you have to inject some sort of personality. But a thing I learned from John uh, was patience, a lot of patience, because it's not I can like make a book in a week and get out and sell it. And it's like, no, that's not how the industry works. You know, it's like these things take a very long time and you just have to gain momentum like sometimes year after year, we started a project in 2018. It's just like late 2018, 2019. It's just now coming out next month, right. you know? Right. Yeah, like, that's, that's, it's a very, yeah, because we're, we're like, well, I mean, another cliche, we're like speedboats, right? <laughs> and they're like ocean liners. So, you know, because everything has to be lined up. And of course, COVID, you know, it okay. would have been, COVID and, and all the different shipping issues around COVID have helped destroy some of the infrastructure there too, so. You know, we had some help there, but you know that's uh. But, yeah, but Brian's right though. It's like you. It's it's the it's always a long game. You know. Yeah. Like for instance, with our publisher, I mean, they for them a hit really is. I mean, of course, everybody wants to sell out of books, right? I mean, you know, the eightfold path comes out. They'd be they'd be you know uh, ridiculously happy if it sold out, right? Oh, that'd be awesome. But, that'd be great. But you know, honestly, for them, like just for their for their um for their uh. uh <clears throat> what they need, you know, for yeah, their metrics. Yeah. If they sell half the books, that's a win, right? Mm-hmm. And then what happens is the rest of those get sold to schools and libraries, which is why they do hard covers to start with. So they're looking at like these larger bulk orders, you know, something like the April Path is teaching Buddhism, that could be picked up in religious studies classes and stuff like that. So that that's the kind of way that they're thinking about selling things. It's very different than like, hey, I made a comic book. Let's the cell on the corner. It's a very different mentality, you know. <laughs> right. um, yeah, but I I want to I want to tell you one one thing too. I want to do a I want to do a shout out to this kid named Eduardo right quick. You know, so when I when these when the comic books went away, you know, I just want to backtrack for a second. When I went when the comic books went away, I was very sad. Obviously, couldn't go to the stop and go anymore. But 
my uncle Willie who just passed away. He's actually one of the only artists I knew, you know, who got me started drawing. Um, sorry for your he was loss. Dating, he was, what'd you say? I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, he was, uh, he was dating a, a woman named Alice at the time. And Alice had a, uh, a son named Eduardo. And remember they, they, they lived in the big city of Jackson, Mississippi. And so Eduardo was kind of like, you know, he was cool, but he was kind of like, who is this country kid, you know? <laughs> but he was in the comic books, really big. He was really big in the comic books. And I remember like having conversations with my comics. He, he had literally hundreds of comics because he lived very close to uh, one of the, one of the, the um, direct market stores. Like I think it was a star store or something like that. So he had like, he had comic books I had never seen before though. Like, it was outside of Marvel and DC because again, in the eighties, you had like an uptick in the independent comics, right? So you had stuff coming up from Eclipse comics and stuff like that and this kid had wide sci-fi taste like he his taste was like wide as mine and his mom made him give me half of his collection because she was going to toss it and he begrudgingly did it because he would rather have someone who loved the comics like he did it was either given to me or, or they're going to go into garbage half of his collection that's insane. Which I, thought was a, which I thought was a good, because usually the mom throws away all this stuff, right? So <laughs> I didn't have it so bad. She's like, I used it. Right? I thought that was really, you know, you got to give away half these books because it's too much, you know? I have this, it's really crazy. I have the same conversation with my wife now. It's like, you are not buying any more books. <laughs> Ever. It's but a good thing. Hey, I'm a publisher. I'm a publisher. People send me books for free. <laughs> you know? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Now, as many all kind of shoes could come up in here, but anyway. Um, so yeah, so that's because of that, um, that it was an act of kindness too, because he could have, you know, he could have probably been a brat about it and complained enough to, that he could keep them or, or hid them somewhere or maybe gave them to someone. Right, exactly. One of his friends so he could still visit his comics, you know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but he gave them to me, you know, he gave them to me. It had to be like 500 comics, you know, and it was stuff like- Oh my like, gosh. Miracle Man, stuff like Sunrunners, DNA Agents, like stuff I had never seen before. I was like, what is these, what are these comics, you know? And uh, stuff from Britain, 2000 AD comics and stuff like that. I was like, what, what are you, what is this, right? And it just changed the way I looked at comics, honestly, you know? And then I want to say like, another thing that happened was like, and then I couldn't afford them, I couldn't buy any new comics. So I would, but, I, but you could get the free bud plant, uh, Mac, the, yep. the book plant the catalog so yeah. i would i would send off with a catalog and i would just drool over what comics i couldn't read <laughs> so it would be yeah. stuff like <laughs> love and rockets and like i didn't know what watchman was then look cool red like, sonia was uh, red sonia it was stuff time. like um the flaming carrot you know <laughs> stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> you know so anyway so i just want to make sure yeah so that that actually those particular things changed where i looked at comics you know and um and he literally he literally changed your life it and literally didn't realize it was just something his mom made him do. Yeah, and I don't know where that kid is, if he's still alive or not. You know, I hope he is and thriving because Eduardo, you changed my life, man. Thank you. Well, yeah. So can you describe the project, this, uh, your collaboration is coming out next month and where people can get it and all that? Go, Brian. <laughs> yeah, so, um, <laughs> cool. So, yep, so the book comes out definitively now, March 22nd. I'm confident about saying that. Is that correct, John? The yes, that's correct. Mark, it got pushed back okay. because of shipping issues. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, everything is getting pushed back because of yeah. shipping issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, Steve Barnes and uh, Charles Johnson are the writers. Um, John put this together. So it's under Megascope, which is an Abrams uh, public imprint that John created. So <clears throat> when John came up with this concept, um, he initially spoke to me about collaborating on this book called Eightfold Path. So I got the script and what John described to me, he said, Brian, you can draw a lot of different styles, which like is my thing. That's what I like to do. And it was like, do that in this book. So that's kind of like putting gasoline on like a, a bomb, you know? <laughs> like, you know, just like pure chaos. It's like, what, I could do my thing? Like, really? So what happened is that um, throughout the course of the book, um, it took about six months to do, mm -hmm. and um, it took a team, and I'm super proud of this book. It's eight different stories, 
and it's called the Eightfold Path. And um, with the Eightfold Path, it's this path to enlightenment, uh, a Buddhist philosophy. And I'm describing it horribly, but I'm doing my best, guys. And so, <laughs> what, <laughs> so John will be able to like piggyback and edit all of my phrasing. So anyway, so in this book, it's eight different stories, and then um, that tells you about hardships, whether it's through the author's vision or through the author's imagination. And so um, you'll get stories with uh, like Kung Fu fighting. You're going to get stories of sci-fi, futuristic zombies. Uh, you're going to get um, alt planet uh, sponge monsters. So it's almost just like a celebration of ideas. And um, I guess that's the best way to word it. And then if you can get something like out of it that connects to you, then that's what the book is supposed to give to you. So mm. I see it almost as like a, um, a mantra or a prayer almost. Um, it's the first time I ever experienced that with a comic. So I'm really proud of it. And this is my first major publication. So I'm super proud of it being my first like out the gate book. Cause I could have done books in the past. Um, like I've been given opportunities since 20 roughly. And I always declined them because I always wanted my like you know, something like this to come up. And so when I had this opportunity, I was all over it. So John, do you have any other thoughts or things to add? Oh yeah, yeah. So so, so the A4 path was on the original pitch for Megascope, you know what I'm saying? So when I, when I brought the, the idea to, to Abrams as a potential book line, you know, uh, Stephen Barnes for a long time, you know, once uh, Sammy Delaney had retired was like one of the only voices in science fiction that happen to be black, right? So he's the right for the Outer Limits. He wrote for, you know, the, the, the Twilight Zone uh, from, the, from, the night, from the 80s, you know, stuff like that. Uh, he's married to Tanari Du, who is like legendary, like horror writer, you know? So they're like a amazing, I actually have a book with them together too, actually, which is coming out, I think next season. So anyway, um, Charles Johnson, of course, is, MacArthur Genius Grant went in, Guggenheim Fellowship went in, National Book of <laughs> National Book of man. This dude, he's his only the second, he's only the second black person to win a National National Book Award. And that was um, well he well since the most but he was he was the second African American to win the National Book Award. The first was uh, Ralph Ellison, you know, wow. who was in the audience <laughs> when wow. he got the award. I know. Amazing. It's crazy. Oh, it's put his book called it's put his book called Middle Passage, actually, which we're also adapting into a graphic novel with uh, Dennis Cowan and Reggie Hudson. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in the early 90s, right? That's correct. Yeah, 90s. Yeah. 90s. yeah. yeah so we're doing yeah, I, I remember Hunt. reading as a kid, John. Yeah, Reggie. So I, I was like in fifth grade. Fifth well, you would have been, that's right. Yeah, but it's it's a great mm -hmm. book. So yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, Dennis Cowan is drawing that book. It's crazy. Anyway, so um what happened was uh they wanted to work together. Uh, Charles is a practicing Buddhist, as as um, as uh, Brian stated. It really is kind of like what what they're doing is they 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 have this thing. It's called via negativa. You know, this idea of like teaching positive ideas through showing negative things. So it's basically like they're all morality tales. And so that what what they were very inspired by was um, the EC comics, like Tales from the Crypt and Vault of Horror and stuff like that. So which are anthology books from the nineteen fifties that would use horror and science fiction dark fantasy to teach morality you know and, and where basically like you know the, the evil doers were always punished you know what i'm saying so when i pitched this idea <laughs> i had to think it was like afrofuturist buddhist canterbury tales <laughs> <laughs> or, or you know what it sounds like is the Grimm's fairy tales it actually has a grim and, and also yeah, she yeah, was, uh, like it also has like a feel of like the arabian nights as well you know mm -hmm. so because or, 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 or ray bradbury is the illustrated man where it's like a bunch exactly. of like, stories, you know? And um, yeah, so basically what happens is like, there's these eight travelers and they come together in this cave. They don't know where to see this, this holy man, you know, in, in, in the mountains and they're stuck there. And then there happens to be an attendant who was expecting them in the cave. And so they have to tell stories and each story is connected to one of the, the noble truths that are connected to the Eightfold Path to Enlightenment. So it's like, so it's teaching Buddhism, but through like, wild ass like horror and, <laughs> <laughs> and then you have like brian's like beautifully abstract you know style bold style that actually links it all together you know we just actually a, a, a critic uh adam mcgovern just said like it was just such, such a bold 
singular vision, even though it was like a collage of like different ideas, you know? So it's a wild book. It's not gonna be for everybody, you know? But I wanted to push the boundaries as far as like curatorial work. I said, okay, well, this is a really, really high concept book. It should be something special and something beautiful, you know? And I think that we brought um, our A game in that regard. So yeah, March 22nd hits the stores. Mm -hmm. I'm super proud of it. It's definitely the hardest project I ever had to do because what um, happened, Chris, is that um, it is a learning curve for me because I'm used to just this independent route. And so when I had to, and I, I worked in professional settings, I'm not like some wild artist or nothing like that. I don't want to get it misconstrued. But what happens is that you, when, during that process, I get the script and this is no reflection in like Abrams. This is literally like the process of the game of book publishing I learned. It's like, it's hard. So I had to like structure, do all the layouts for the book and then insert the lettering so that, yeah. the, uh, so that they can have that as a package ready so that when I do the art, all they have to do is insert art over uh, what the letterer recreated, meaning like the word bubbles and everything. So yeah. that being said, that was like the first three months and during that time, while doing that, um, I brought in a crew of artists from Columbus um, and they're, they're credited in a book. So I'm really proud of that aspect because I was handling it almost like, um, almost like a, a, like a mixtape or kind of like how Kanye produces albums. Yeah. You know, he'll just bring in 60 producers. Yeah. Like it's not, and so he almost divorces himself so you're actually letting people do like these micro expressions. Some artists actually did bigger expressions. So, because mm -hmm. I was like, hey, how about you do the layout so I can like see how that looks and then I can put my style on top of that. So it's almost as if they're making the beat and then I'm the rapper or like we could flip it. Really and great. It's like, uh, Yo. Alan Murray. Yeah, thank you, John. So it's like, what you're going to see is like, obviously a, a technical like prowess through it. So when you look at the book, it's like every panel is important. It's nothing where you're getting a, um, like a mid, like you're not getting mids, you know? It's like everything hits, every panel, every page is an, an a, um, expression of art. You know, it's like I'm challenging compositions and stuff like that. So I really want people to like really focus on a lot of those aspects when they're reading it. Cause there's a lot of intention behind every panel and there's nothing in there that's like, wasn't intentional. So I just want everyone to be celebrated and get their credit. And so when you look at the, that book and you check out one of the stories, you're like, oh, that's pretty dope. Like you'll see the credit and you're like, oh, I really like that person's stuff. You know what I mean? So I just wanted to put a highlight on that. Awesome. And if people want to follow you and keep up with your work, um, what's the best way? Do you have social media handles or a web and or a website where people can check your stuff out? Yeah, yes. mine is gonna be, oh, sorry, go ahead, John. No, no, you go first, you, you were speaking. Okay, yeah, mine is really short. Um, mine is Strange Things Moss. Um, that's my Instagram. Uh, my email is strangethingsmoss at gmail.com. Um, I reply to both of those. I apologize if there's like tardiness or lateness because I'm just really busy right now. So yeah, hit me up or follow. You know, I always like meet new people. And uh, uh, for me, you can find me at johnjenningsstudio.com, all one word. And um, you can find, if you go to contact section, uh, <clears throat> you can see like my uh, agent's content you know, for, for speaking and for doing like image making for like advertising and such. And also, I am also on Instagram uh, and that is John Jennings Art, all one word. And Twitter is uh, J.I. Jennings. So my middle name is Ira actually oh, wow. <laughs> oh cool wow well, right yeah I really like that um yeah um so yeah this has been great man i had a lot of fun and it's funny because i feel like because all of us are so tired we actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, speak, and i'm actually I, I could actually speak to you all for hours i'm actually about to go do a talk at the um this local library about lady wrestlers so i i'm uh, oh like, yeah dude yeah oh man thank you so much for that film yeah. dude. i wanted to tell oh, it's incredible it's incredible john I love it. I, Great I, I, job I, on that, Chris. I, I bought it on uh, I bought it on, on, on Amazon, and um, so so check it right quick, man. So I'm doing a I'm doing a story right now. Are you familiar with this character called Phantoma? No, I'm not. She, she yeah. was one of the first 
like superheroines, right? She was this this beautiful blonde white woman who lived in Africa, and uh, I know it's like the Queen of the Jungle, kind Carl, of. It's Carl Carl Queen of the Jungle character. But check it out. But, but what's different about her is that she, like a lot of those jungle characters, they protected Africa's resources, which is always really interesting to me. So you have these white, yeah. like you know, like the Phantom was like get yeah. up out of Africa, right? Um, and so basically, she would do this thing where people were trying to poach from Africa, she would turn into this hideous blue skull, skull face creature and she had powers like, you know the character of the Spectre from DC Comics? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She she had almost like unlimited power. So basically she said, don't take those diamonds. And if they take the diamonds, <laughs> she would turn into a scorpion and sting you in the face. It was crazy, whatever, you know, it was just, it was mm -hmm. nuts. So I'm doing, me and my friend Damien and, um, and David Brain, we did, uh, we doing this like, She's a public domain character, so we did a version of her, and I was influenced by your film. So I turned her into wow. a lady, I turned her into a lady into a black lady. Oh, that, is a, that is an honor, John. Wow, yeah, I am, she's, I am she's a wrestler. Wow, I, I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you an, an image of her. Um, I would love that. Yeah, she. I turned her into like a, a, a kind of like female luchador, uh, and awesome, so she's awesome. and she's a she's a monster wrestler. Yep. What an honor! Wow. Yeah. If you like this video, please leave a comment, share it, and subscribe to my channel.